So let's start with the first speaker, uh, Vivian Popkin uh, from the Research Center for Hanse and Baltic History, uh, which is a member of the Reed Cove, and I think we already did a summer school together. Is that yes. right? Yes, we did last Good. year. <laughs> um, hopefully okay. soon tuned. the next one. <laughs> right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Vivian, and today I will be giving an overview on how we use citizen science in our Hansa document pro uh, presentation and project. We are currently a team of two people, so this might seem rather small, but uh, considering that we are two people, we've actually done quite a lot of work assisting uh, with the help of our citizen scientists. Uh, we've started working with transcribers in 2018. First, we used the free version, and we've been a member since, I think, 2020, something along those lines and of course have done quite a lot of stuff with them. Um, first, I'll give you an overview of what our project actually is, what our resources are, and what we're dealing with. And then I will be um, explaining how Outreach Network actually assists in gaining more knowledge about HTR and including more people. Then, of course, the main aspect, citizen science. Later, I'll also talk about our uh, present social media influences, which is also related to the uh, range of citizen science. And then, of course, the final product, the read and search page. This is an outline of our project. First, we have the research project. Our goal is to make available all the sources from the Hansa town meetings from the 16th and 17th century. These haven't been edited yet, so they are still in the archives and basically very difficult to use because they haven't been transcribed yet. And of course, you need to go to the archive. You need to say, OK, I want these two pages. And you all know working in an archive is uh, quite a time consuming uh, work. So to make them available uh, already transcribed definitely lowers the time effort. This is our goal. Our first step is, as you've seen in the outline, um, gaining more knowledge about transcribers. This was how we started working with it. This is how we uh, gained our first group of citizen scientists. Then, with the help of our crowd, we transcribe these pages, and then we publish all our sources with the addition of metadata for people and places, so uh, with entities. Now, what are our sources? On the left side, you can see all the sources that have been edited. The first Hansa meeting, so for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with the Hansa, that was a um, loose collection of uh, traders and trading towns in northern Germany, northern Europe, that uh, stretched to very far regions of Europe. And um, there wasn't a constitution or all these things, so it is a bit difficult to define the Hansa. But if you're interested in that, of course, feel free to drop us an email um, or read about the project online. Well, as I said, these towns met in regular um, time intervals. So every few years to up to every, uh, several 10 years. Um, these meetings were completed with minutes, the so-called recesses. And they have been edited until 1537. Not because something happened in 1537, but that's when the editors just ran out of time and funding. So until the last Hansa meeting, which was probably around 1669. There is some debate about whether it was actually the last Hansa meeting, but it is in uh, research currently regarded as the last one. Uh, there are still 150 years of uh, Hansa meetings, and they have never been looked at, or very rarely, because as I said, it's quite difficult uh, work to, to work with the archives, and it is time consuming. So these are our resources. Um, as you can see, they have a very specific layout. They are usually very um, in a very clean handwriting because they were written as a pro not as a protocol, but as a final result. So as a collection of all the decisions that had been agreed upon. Last year, you mentioned the summer school. Um, we really started um, broadening up our citizen science project. We started our project in 2020, but in 2021, we were trying to really gain, a, get a, a bigger group of citizen scientists and also include some researchers. The summer school was targeted not only at students, but also at early career researchers and basically researchers from any age group and uh, career point who were interested in working with uh, digital tools to discover history. Um, this had quite the impact on our HDR strategy as well because a group developed who is now working on HDR models for the 15th century on Middle Lower German, which as some of you might probably know, 
um, is still a time that isn't represented as much in the HDR models as some other times. And uh, if you're interested in this, uh, visit the presentation of my colleague Julian Helmchen later in the lightning talks. Yeah, the feedback on the digital summer school was really, really well. Um, it was during the pandemic, so we were a bit hesitant on actually doing a live event, and of course it wouldn't have been possible anyways. Um, with digital tools, it is, of course, really, uh, really convenient if everyone is sitting on their laptop and can really try along and really everyone can import their own sources and transcribers and try out their own HDR models. So the digital format and especially the feedback on using HDR in their own research was amazing. Uh, this is why we're planning to do another digital summer school next year, hopefully again with transcribers and other colleagues from other fields. Um, Two students also assisted us in our project after this for half a year, um, helped with the um, tagging of metadata and helped with the proofreading. Now, citizen science, of course, is the bulk of our project. Uh, we have quite a lot of sources. So alone in the archive of Lübeck, there are around at least 2,000 to 3,000 pages of Hansel resources. And to read and transcribe all of them in a team of two, that would take years because, of course, this is not the only thing that we do at our research center. Um, this is why we decided to include others into our research, namely people from, well, citizens. So these are people without, not necessarily without academic background, but usually without academic background in historical context. So some of our um, researchers and citizen scientists are, were accountants before they, or are still accountants. One of our uh, citizen scientists was a doctor, and they all come with very different um, interests in our project. Some of them say, okay, I just really like the, uh, difficult, um, the difficulty of trying to read an old text. I just really like the riddle of it. Okay, what is this letter? So for them, it's really just a fascination of trying to decipher something. For others, it is really learning more about the Hansa history, so about the local history, because they are from Lübeck or from the Hansa towns. So they want to know more about, let's say, old families, maybe even the family they are from, or just family, friends or maybe just about the people that their names they read on the um, street names. So this is really a very interesting project because you get to um, see completely different and new perspectives on your sources. Of course, you get all the transcriptions, which is amazing, and I'll talk more about that later on, how we process these transcriptions. But just the, um, just the work itself is really quite rewarding because you see um, that people can engage with your sources without previous historical knowledge and really make something of it and can actually it can, has a, have a huge impact on their life because for them it's a hobby and something they quite enjoy doing. Um, our citizen science project consists of a, basically a dual strategy. Um, it is a virtual project, so people can participate wherever they are. If some of them want to say, okay, I'm participating while I'm on the train going somewhere and just like to feel, or feel like transcribing a few pages, they can join us there. Others can do it at home from their comfortable couches. So um, it's really quite flexible. And we also do uh, citizen science events. And this is more of a uh, outreach and uh, networking aspect too, because of course it's nice to, to invite our people and have an evening or a, basically usually we do a day where we spend the first half of the day transcribing the sources, discussing a few more difficult pages or more difficult words, because sometimes there are words where you really need to take a closer look and um, try a different ways to decipher it. And in the afternoon, we usually do something like a guide tour through the museum. Last time we went to the archive of Lübeck, so everyone could have a look at the originals, which was quite amazing. Um, We've got a few, um, a few of our citizen scientists saying, okay, this is how I always imagined historians work, going to the archive, looking at the originals, and it's just so much fun to um, see how people engage with your sources. Um, we also did at the uh, Long Night of the Museums recently a workshop where people sometimes dropped in for 10 minutes to just take a look at the facsimiles we um, were showing, and some others stayed for half an hour to even up to an hour just uh, really delving into the examples of sources that we had presented and uh, transcribing um, as much as they could. Now, the thing is, um, what do we actually do with the sources? Uh, this is a diagram of our um, Read Hansa Sources rounds. Read Hansa Sources is our project, um, in German, Hansa Quellen Lesen, so 
Um, there you go. And in 2020, we started with roughly 400 pages. Um, just a selection of documents from the 17th century, and they are by now all available on our read and search page. Um, I'll show the QR code later, so you can have a look at that. Um, it was quite some work to prepare this, because of course in the beginning you really need to think, okay, what do I need to be aware of? And when you're starting the citizen science project, and there isn't much knowledge, not many uh, help texts available, um, it's quite a difficult uh, way of implementing this. In our second round, we had, well, not that many more pages, but a few more. And now, in this year, um, we are aiming at 710 pages. And since April, this is when our current round started, our real group of, I would say, three to five active citizen scientists have transcribed almost 400 pages. Um, the 363 I've counted here are from complete documents. And there are some pages that are already completed and documents that haven't been finished yet, so this is why I only counted a few of them. Um, and that's amazing. I mean, they are currently proofreading the HDR transcriptions, some of them at least, and some others say, okay, they really enjoy doing the, uh, the groundwork, doing the transcription from scratch. And since this brings quite good results, we try to make both options available to our citizen scientists, because it is, of course, for us, for gaining the uh, ground truth and for gaining information, but the main aspect that we really have to consider when doing citizen science is that people do this in their free time. So you want to keep them engaged and you want to really um, make this work useful for you, but also make it fun for them. And um, usually you found a perfect middle ground. Uh, as you can see here, our um, workload actually lowered quite considerably. In the beginning, we had to prove read a lot and uh, just preparing the layout analysis and fixing these small mistakes was really important because this is what confuses people the most. If you have a split line, you can explain that to researchers who've worked with transcribers, but it's really difficult to explain to someone who has never worked with historical sources who might not even be that familiar with digital tools or even his computer. Um, our crowd is of a varying age group and varying background, so explaining digital tools can be quite challenging, uh, although we've basically no one left who has actual problems or really struggles with it. So this is quite a learning experience for everyone involved. And of course, they don't only learn about digital tools, they learn about the sources and about the handwriting, which is amazing because my proofreading has actually lowered quite considerably. In the beginning, there were a lot of mistakes um, in the transcriptions that we got. But by now, I would say some of them read the 17th century um, protocols like the newspaper, and I have to maybe correct a lowercase letter to a capital letter or something like this, but usually it's not that much. Um, here you can see our, well, on the left side you can see one of our older models. This was done after the first two rounds of Reed Hunt's sources, and this is a test page of our documents. Um, as you can see, this is um, already quite good, and uh, some of the mistakes are just lower and smaller uh, letters, so this is, um, I think, something that can actually be argued about um, on our citizen science days, um, discussing about different spellings, or whether it is a lowercase or a capital letter, or whether it is an IJ or an epsilon is usually one of the main questions. Um, and on the right side, you can see the model. I've created this just last week, um, adding the 300, not even the whole 300, I think it was like 250 pages I've added from the current round. And as you can see, the uh, mistakes in spelling have completely been eliminated, and now it's only lowercase and capital letter mistakes. And this, of course, makes reading the uh, sources much more, uh, yeah, well, much better. And of course, it's also rewarding to share this with your crowd. So what do we do with these results? Of course, we use them to transcribe more sources. Um, yeah, this is just an overview and, and how we've basically um, been received in press and social med uh, media. Uh, there were quite a few uh, reviews in local and nationwide press. Um, and on Twitter, of course, citizen science is always a, a well-received hashtag. Um, Another thing there is currently in Germany, uh, the new government has implemented a citizen science in their um, four-year strategy, and the um, independent company, um, which is um, usually, there isn't, let me start again. 
there is also this independent company which works with citizen science, and they have also they have written a recommendation, sort of 400-page book on how to implement citizen science and how to uh, make funds available and which strategies need to be implemented nationwide. And we've also been included there. Um, so what we're doing, this is the read and search page. We're making these uh, these documents available, and we share all of our information information with our crowd. At the beginning, it was a bit difficult to explain the um, scientific approach and to explain that we're not doing an edition, but we're doing just a transcription. Um, that is a huge difference because in our sources, we have a lot of um, different, uh, well, V and U, for example, are used interchangeably, although they wouldn't be uh, used as such if you were pronouncing the words. And explaining that to people who don't come from that historical training can be quite challenging because you need to explain, okay, no, we're keeping the wrong spelling even though we know what the correct spelling would be and even though it would be much more user-friendly to use the correct spelling. Um, this is why you need to decide on rules. And this was one of the first steps we realized um, because we didn't have any in the beginning, so two years ago. Uh, now we have them. And you really need to think of a set of rules. So you need to uh, write some guidelines on how to work with your sources. To people who have never worked with them before, really try to take that step back and think, okay, if I didn't know anything about history and how to work with documents, how would I encounter these sources? How would I look at them? Of course, that's not always possible to make that um, transfer of thought. This is why these um, meetings with our crowd and our citizen scientists are really amazing because there you have that exchange. There you have people telling you that it's really difficult to understand why you would um, use this letter and not the other one and where you can have all these discussions and actually work on these rules and write down these guidelines together. So it is very much a project that, well, it requires quite a lot of communication with your crowd and it really requires close contact um, even on, on, sometimes you receive questions via email where you're not quite sure how to reply because you really need to reconsider how you look at your sources. And this is also, I think, one of the gains of the project. On the one hand, you see how people who have not had previous contact with history um, learn from these sources, but also how you can learn from this different perspective. And of course, explaining how you do your work is a great way of actually learning how you do your work and rethinking your steps and really write a very specific workflow for yourself and for your own project. So, as I said, this is the link to our read and search page. There are currently the uh, documents from our first round, soon probably from our second round available, and hopefully by the end of the year from our third round. And then uh, the whole Hansa Resistance from the Archive of Lübeck will be online available, tagged with people and places. Um, of course, we don't want to stop there because <laughs> digitizing all the Hansa recesses from Lübeck is not enough. Um, our first goal is to uh, gain more, more material. There are so many Hansa documents hidden in other archives all across uh, Europe. We're currently in contact with uh, archives in uh, Poland, um, looking into archives in northern Germany and the Netherlands, and we will upload them there over the course of the next years, as long as we have our project, um, and tag them with people and places so their database is searchable. Um, creating a Hansa database with Nordgaard, which uh, had a wonderful workshop yesterday, we are also trying, uh, or we, we are already doing, we've included most of the Hansa recesses uh, and their meetings, the towns that were present, and linked it to the archival source from the 17th century, and we are also working on concluding this, um, which is a long-term project because this is really just very time-intensive, but also something we include in our summer school. So in a way, it's not citizen science, but more researchers, including science. Um, and of course, create more HDR models. Because as much fun as it is to really transcribe from scratch, a lot of our users and citizen science are aware that there is a faster way of doing this. So they are asking us, okay, is there a new model because the current one is not that good? And then you really have to, you really have to give them something and this is something that motivates a lot. Because you see, not only are you doing this research to bring your own project along, but you're doing this because there are people who are sitting at home and are just creating a new material for their hobby. So I would say, uh, 11 out of 10, I recommend citizen science to, I would say, almost everyone because you can implement it even on a smaller project um, in a relatively time-efficient way 
if you put in the work at the beginning, it just becomes very, very efficient at the end. I would say thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, feel free to ask them. I have some flyers for our project here, so if you're interested, uh, I'll hand them out later, and this is the link to our project page. Thank you very much. Microphone's still off, I guess. No, no, it's working. Thank you very much for your presentation, and uh, as you already said, Give us some questions, please. Yes, that's impressive. Um, I was wondering, how do you do the distribution of the, uh, uh, of the documents? And do you use scans or registration or whole documents? Um, that depends. We usually have the whole document. We have a collection that is uh, public, publicly accessible. And well, to be honest, I usually just ask our citizen science, do you have a favorite documents that you want to take a closer look at next? Because some of them usually just click around in the collection. And it's not necessarily, sometimes they pick um, documents that look more difficult than handwriting, so it's more, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. And sometimes, the, recently, we've had two documents from 1518, and one of our citizen scientists had the theory that it is the same scribe, so he wanted to transcribe all the documents in this, um, in around plus minus five years from 1518. So um, it really varies a lot because depending on which interest your, your crowd brings into the project, um, their requests change. And of course also the distribution. Transcribus has that user activity function, which is great if you just want to see who's currently working on what project. Um, and I also just keep, uh, keep a simple Word document where I note down who's working on which, which pages. But usually it's one document, so one recess per person. Okay. We've got a question here in front. Thank you. Thank you for this very inspiring talk. Uh, I have two questions. One about, uh, about your workflow. Uh, if I did not misunderstand, you are doing the quality check yourself once the volunteers transcribe, you mm -hmm. go over them. Yes. Or is there a way to maybe imp implement um, quality control by the, by the volunteers themselves. Is there a way to, for example, ask a second volunteer or third volunteer to go over the mm -hmm. transcriptions? Um, related to that, do you ask volunteers to uh, transcribe from scratch or do they just correct the HDR process transcriptions? And my other question, or the third question, I guess, is how did you find the right crowd? I am currently working on building and promoting my own crowdsourcing project in a different platform, not in Transcribus. And we, are, we know that there is a community who, who will be very interested in this kind of work, but we are really struggling to find the correct venue to reach yeah. to them. So what was your PR strategy? Thank you. Well, I start with the, thank you for your question. I'll start with the last one first. Um, our PR strategy was, I think, quite accidental, actually. Uh, we started a project during the pandemic because we just thought it would be nice to do something very different from for a change. And we mentioned our project, or it was mentioned since we're, um, our offices are located at the museum and we work very closely with the Museum for Hansa History. And I think it was first mentioned during one of the guided tours. And that's how we got a few science scientists and then the uh, independent company I mentioned. They um, have a platform where they list all the citizen science projects in Germany. Um, it might be Germany and German-speaking countries, I'm not 100% certain. And our project is listed there. We are also aiming to include our project in other citizen science platforms that are more Europe-inclusive because it can be possible to work on our sources even if you're not 100% sure in speaking German, since it's an older version of German anyways. Um, so this is how we found our crowd and um, finding a, a good crowd, I think that just happens on the way because the people learn and if they're really determined and finding joy in the project, then they learn while they're doing it basically. And the people who say, okay, it's a bit, more a bit too advanced for me or maybe they're not comfortable with working so closely with digital tools, they usually don't, don't stick around for that long. Um, or they go to other citizen science projects, so you really f or they only come to the um, live events, so to say, because for them it might be more comfortable working uh, with a paper print or a facsimile. So this is basically how we, how we got our crowd. Um, we do have some who proofread, but um, there's also one of our uh, citizen scientists who is doing or assisting us with the layout analysis. So the skill set varies as well. 
but um, currently I'm doing the proofreading um, just so we have some more news from historic contracts uh, doing the, uh, I say, final tag. And also because we're doing the tagging with metadata, we do that via the search uh, function. So search for uh, names, search for places, and then we tag all of them. But since I'm doing the proofreading, sometimes, especially with names, names that are only mentioned once or twice in the documents, you don't find them with the search version because you don't know what to look for. So uh, this is why I also do the tagging sort of on the go and why someone needs to go currently over the documents as one final step. Yeah. Okay. I think, Anamiki, you had a question as well, if I saw that correctly. <laughs> Well, given the workshop we, uh, we gave, uh, it might be an obvious question, but how do you acknowledge uh, the participation or the contributions of your crowd? What is your solution to that? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, we, on our written search page, we are aiming to have a sort of a thank you for our citizen scientists, but not all of them are comfortable with being mentioned by name. So basically we just mention our crowd there and we do on these live events, they are free for them. So we invite them into our museum, there is food, there is drinks, there's usually free entrance to the museum, to the exhibition and a guided tour, um, a visit to the archives and all these things. So we really try to compensate that with events and with experiences. Because, as I said, being mentioned by name is not always uh, is not always what they're what they're comfortable with. However, um, the uh, I think on the press page you can see here um, the press articles are a way for um, for mentioning the people uh, explicitly as well. Last winter, we had a meeting with one um, reporter from a local press and a sort of like um, country press. And we invited a few of our crowd. Um, we had, of course, cakes and dinner because what else would you would you? Um, but they were mentioned by name. They were interviewed, and then they were um, there were I think two or three articles written in local and more um, regional press. So this is really um, also something you try to figure out on the go. Okay, perfect. Any more questions? Yeah. One here in the uh, fourth, yeah, row. <laughs> yes, so thank you for the presentation. I have a sort of technical question about uh, metadata, and uh, I would like to know how. So, you, if I understand correctly, you include the metadata through tagging, and I'm interested in: is there a way to like connect this with uh, out uh, the, the other databases like Wikidata or some something like that? Mm, that is a good question because we are doing this uh, since a lot of names and places come up um, over the course of the time we are looking at. A lot of the names are doubled, especially when you look at the uh, Lübeck mayors or the people who were in the uh, local government, a lot of, they have similar names or even the same names and there is no universal spelling. So the spelling varies depending on the year, on the scribe and probably on the weather and the mood of the day. So um, it is very uh, tough to identify a person just by name. Um, the National German Library has a database where every entity is um, given a string of numbers and words or numbers and letters. And while doing the tagging, we do the research, try to find as many people as possible, and identify them with this um, with this link. To it is a it is a stable URL or a stable link, definitely. So this will be available for a long time, um, since it is a governmental national library thing. And on the read and search page, we link the people also via the G, it's called GND, and we also link them via the GND link. So um, by doing this, we make sure that once we tag Lübeck, we always end up having the Lübeck in northern Germany and not the one in America, uh, since they were probably not present in 1637. Thank you. Okay. So if there are no questions anymore, I'd say we stop here. Um, also, of course, you get one of those. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, and then we'll move on.